Welcome back to our esophageal symposium, an update on esophageal disease put on by the Cleveland Clinic. Once again, I'd like to uh, thank you all for sticking with us through this long day, but it's been a great, great symposium. And we're going to uh, finish up with a discussion of Barrett's esophagus. Uh, Barrett's esophagus, when I was in medical school, was something you memorized. You know, you never were going to see that. Barrett's esophagus was what we called a metaplasia. And we had to memorize that word. And then we knew that uh, it was the change of one type of epithelium into another, and some kind of injury caused it. And we memorized it, and we were done with it. And certainly, general surgeons didn't much care about it. And uh, gastroenterologists were just barely doing endoscopy there, so they weren't too much interested in it. But some things have changed. Uh, epidemiology has changed, and the nature of esophageal cancer has changed. And so we have to address it today. Uh, a good way to begin on the discussion of Barrett's is to have one of the world's experts, uh, John Goldblum, who is our shining star in pathology. And he's going to talk about uh, Barrett's esophagus with and without dysplasia. And he'll tell us about it. So John, thank you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. OK, well, I wanted to just sort of get everybody up to speed a brief pathology um, summary. Uh, basically, we'll start with the uh, definition of Barrett's esophagus and show you a histologic slide of Barrett's without dysplasia. Uh, there's basically two components to the diagnosis of Barrett's esophagus. There must be an endoscopic abnormality, and then the biopsy from the area of the endoscopic abnormality in the esophagus has to show what's on the screen, which is evidence of intestinal metaplasia. Um, see if I can, I don't know if I can point to anything or not. You can if you just put your finger <laughs> around. Okay, fabulous. Um, so for example, right here in this biopsy, this, so this is a biopsy from the distal esophagus, presumably, and what we're seeing, let's see, right here and here and here are goblet cells. And basically my job is pretty simple, and that is to be very clear about whether I identify goblet cells, which is a synonym for intestinal metaplasia. The two words are equivalent. Um, so my report has to be very clear about whether I see goblet cells because at least according to the American College of Gastroenterology, one requires the identification of goblet cells to make the diagnosis of Barrett's esophagus. Um, where I focus my energy, oh, I'm sorry, where I focus my energy once I diagnose Barrett's is up here on the surface to look for dysplasia. And the fact of the matter is <coughs> the vast majority of biopsies for Barrett's are negative for dysplasia. And I always sort of start there assuming that it's negative for dysplasia and sort of, I sort of feel like you got to push me off this <coughs> spot before I'm going to call it uh, dysplastic. <coughs> now obviously there's a spectrum of cytologic atypia uh, spanning from low grade dysplasia to high grade dysplasia to cancer and a lot of these cases are difficult but I'm showing you a case here that I think is fairly straightforward, a case of low grade dysplasia in Barrett's. <coughs> in essence, what I'm looking for is uh, cytologic atypia, not only in the glands, which are shown down here, but really importantly, up on the surface. <coughs> and so what I'm looking for <coughs> generally at low magnification are enlarged, dark-looking nuclei. And I, I actually don't think you have to be a pathologist to sort of say this looks different than the last slide. The nuclei are a lot uh, darker, and they are larger, um, and the atypia does involve the surface. <coughs> So to me, this is dysplastic, and then I have to make a decision as to whether it's low or high grade, since somebody long ago was smart enough to take away moderate dysplasia as a choice. So we only have two choices, <clears throat> and in essence, it's the degree of cytologic atypia that separates low-grade dysplasia from high-grade dysplasia, and uh, based upon the cytologic atypia in this particular slide, uh, this is low-grade dysplasia. I, I don't think I need to go into much detail other than to show you this pictorially, because this is a biopsy of high-grade dysplasia. Again, to the casual observer, this should look a lot worse to most people, and it is, because again, not only is the atypia <clears throat> down here in the glands, but it's up here on the surface. And the fact of the matter is the degree of the atypia here is far worse than it was in the last slide, um, warranting a diagnosis of high-grade dysplasia in Barrett's. And so, <clears throat> you know, some cases are this straightforward in separating low from high-grade dysplasia, but the fact of the matter is there's a lot of cases that are in this spectrum between low and high, um, and those are the really difficult cases, to be honest. And then, of course, the next case would be uh, adenocarcinoma. <clears throat> the first <clears throat> step for adenocarcinoma is invasion into the lamina propria, and there are some cases in which the invasion is limited to the mucosa, and we call that intramucosal adenocarcinoma. And that's shown, for example, here, where we have irregular infiltrating glands that are uh, into the lamina propria, but they haven't gone 
uh, deep to that. So this is limited to the mucosa. I think the important point here is, <clears throat> unlike the colon, where there are, uh, presumably are no lymphatic channels in the colonic mucosa, in the esophageal mucosa there are lymphatic channels, and there is a small but definite risk of um, lymph node metastasis, even if the adenocarcinoma is restricted to the mucosa. And that's what this slide shows, which is intramucosal adeno. So that's a brief summary of Barrett's low-grade, high-grade, and uh, adenocarcinoma. All right, so at this point, before we go into cases, I want to create a little discussion. Thank you very much, John, uh, about the treatment of Barrett's esophagus. So uh, historically, I believe the treatment of Barrett's esophagus has been medical therapy. And certainly Barrett's esophagus does not always turn into cancer, and it's managed well. What is the incidence of, uh, uh, in this country, of the uh, United States, I should say that because we're in 22 countries, but what is the incidence of Barrett's esophagus progressing to cancer? John, do you? Uh, I don't know exactly what the incidence is, to be honest, but it's very low. I mean, as I said at the very beginning, the vast majority of biopsies are negative for dysplasia. That's because the vast majority of yeah. patients with Barrett's never develop adenocarcinoma. It, it's in the single digit percentile, <laughs> I think. Is, Tolga, do you know the number? So it, it is very low. So there's, there's different estimates and uh, so I go through this with my patients all the time. So I, I sort of have a canned speech for this. The, um, I try to tell them that we estimate maybe somewhere around, uh, you know, 3 to 4% of the population, maybe even a larger, may have Barrett's esophagus. And we're talking now millions of people. And if you look at the yearly incidence of esophageal cancer, we're in the 20,000 to 30,000 range. And so the incidence of this is very low. So if you have Barrett's esophagus, your chance of having cancer within the next year without dysplasia is extremely low. With low-grade dysplasia, we used to think it was relatively high, but it's probably really less than 1 in 200, or maybe around that time. But there have been uh, different studies on this, and there are some studies that, there's some population studies that looked at low-grade dysplasia, and they found that it was around 1 in 200. Then later studies came and looked at uh, what happens when you ablate people with low-grade dysplasia, and they found that that was maybe higher. But it is really low. The, but where it really changes is when you get to high-grade dysplasia, and you could have a one-year occurrence of uh, malignancy in those patients. It could be as high as maybe 15% in some people. So, so let me stop you a moment, and I want to take this in a stepwise fashion, assuming we have patients. If you find a patient because the patient came in for reflux, and you're treating him, as we suggested earlier, with PPIs for long term. And then they, we agreed earlier, and the audience will remember, that that kind of patient should have one screening endoscopy to look for Barrett's esophagus. Let's assume that they do have Barrett's esophagus, and we'll agree that the usual AGA and ASGE uh, criteria are, first of all, you have to do biopsies of the, uh, of the Barrett's esophagus. You want to tell us what the Seattle protocol is? Do you use the Seattle protocol? I, I do. So I do. I, I knew you did. Really That's why I asked you. It. Go ahead. Tell us what it is. I try, to use, I try to give my pathologist the biggest, the best specimens as possible. So the Seattle protocol basically says you take four quadrant biopsies every one centimeter. And in fact, I try to use the biggest forceps I can get down the, the endoscope. It's, it's the smallest one I use is a large cap, sometimes jumbo forceps, if, if it'll actually fit through that. You cap. almost do an ESD and, of the entire esophagus. You're denuding it. I, I do a lot of biopsies, and, uh, and really my fear is that I'm going to miss something because right now, and this is going to change in the future, and the studies are being done for this right now, we are doing blind biopsies. We sort of look at the esophagus, and I, we say, okay, I'm going to take a bite from here and another bite from there. And uh, the problem is anybody who's done actually a, a Barrett surveillance of a, of a long segment of esophagus knows after the first two bites, it's just a bloodbath. You don't even know how many centimeters you're at. Yeah. So you end up missing a lot of tissue that you may then... And in fact, if you're counting one centimeter, it, 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 then you get to the top of where you should be. You're running out of centimeters now, but there's still more Barrett's to go. And then you have to go back and change the distances that you calculated in the beginning. It's too hard to do it that way. Um, in, in, in the, the future research is going to be on basically targeting biopsies based on these uh, mucosal imaging techniques that are going to be coming down the pipe. <laughs>
So wouldn't you say, and here's what I like to do if I say, if there's any mucosal abnormality, any irregularity or granularity or nodularity, that should be biopsied first and separately. Uh, then you yeah. start to do your, your four quadrant biopsies. But nodular areas are worrisome, irregular areas, target those first. Then if there's everything else is equal, you start at the bottom and work to the top. I actually go every two centimeters, you do every one. I use the typical Boston Scientific big cup one, but I don't go to, I don't change to the real big cup one, which you're probably using. They scare me to death. They almost do into muscular tissue, but they're, they're quite big. Um, Fred Weinstein from UCLA actually described this technique as well. Um, okay, so we have, uh, let's assume that we have non-dysplastic Barrett's. You, you buy, do all your biopsies on this patient the first time, and all the biopsies come back non-dysplastic Barrett's. When do you, let's say that the patient has four or five centimeters of Barrett's. It's not a real short segment. What would you do with that patient next? That, that's a great question. And I feel like the guidelines are a bit vague and they sort of fail us on this one. So I'm really glad you asked this. Um, if we go straight by the guidelines, you should bring the patient back in the next uh, you know, couple of years and then biopsy again if there was no dysplasia. But what I find is that I'm really worried about whether or not I'm actually doing a very a good representative sampling. And I wonder about a couple of things. One is, what is the risk factors of, of this patient? Is this a young patient with a family history of esophageal cancer? Is this somebody who has significant inflammation in the esophagus when the biopsies were done? And what I try to do is take a thorough set of biopsies, place the patient on proton pump inhibitors if they were not on it, and I bring them back in about six months and then repeat the biopsies. Do you and do that is, every uh, six biopsy. months forever? Let's assume that the next no. one is negative. <clears throat> if that's okay, it's not more reassured and then every two to three years surveillance after that. But I have to say, I have to give you a disclaimer though, if you look at the guidelines that are published, that they will advise you to do your first, uh, your second endoscopy in a, in a longer interval than six months. So that's, two that's to three years is what they say. Two to three years, okay. Right. So, so right. my objection to that is that you may actually be having some sampling area, and if you're not really able to determine if there's a nodularity and you don't, you don't biopsy that area, in two to three years, now you have somebody with esophageal cancer in your hand. All right, so in the meantime, you're treating this patient aggressively with PPIs, is that correct? Yes. So if there is no, if the person is already on PPIs once a day and there's no inflammation, I keep them on it. If there is a significant inflammation while, stay, while they're still on it once daily, then I'll double it up. But I try to use the lowest dose that I can. So that's interesting to me because these patients frighten me a little bit. I put them on 40 BID because they are at risk. And uh, I got Dr. Pimentel back here. Hey, Ronnie, what would you do for this patient who's got, first time you found non-dysplastic Barrett's and you biopsied it, how do you follow them and how do you treat them in the interim now? Well, I agree most of what Tolga said. I normally bring him in a year. I put him on PPI. I try not to, there's not good evidence saying that putting him on a very high PPI or anything like that will prevent progression to dysplasia. And then after the first year, I'll do it every two to three years, as the guideline says. All right. And uh, I think uh, some of the things to uh, practical things, you can spray the esophagus with epinephrine before you do those biopsies, and that reduces a lot of the bleeding for that obscure your field. And also in terms of targeting, I think NBI helps you a little bit. You can see changes of pit pattern that you can direct your biopsies in the meanwhile, and then you go through the regular protocol. I think those are great, great points. So narrow band imaging, <clears throat> you use that during your biopsying. You use yes, NBI, I, narrow I, I band. Look at the virus, I, I, I look at the virus with white light and with NBI, and the, if there's anything, any changes of the, of the mucosa pattern, I try to go for those first. So I want to just point out to the audience I don't have the answers. No one of us has the answers. And what I'm trying to do is learn tricks from everybody that we can all learn. This is how we do better. 
by learning these tricks, spraying the mucosa with epinephrine to slow down the bleeding, because we get a lot of bleeding, using, using narrow band imaging to help look for mucosal irregularities. Jonathan, I want to ask you, does, yeah. does all that blood that we create hurt the biopsies at all? It doesn't bother you doesn't at all. doesn't affect us at create all. Create the blood. It doesn't bother yeah, him we're, at we're all. We're good with it. All right, so let me ask a different question. You said you're going to put him on PPIs, Tolga, and you, I said I put him on 40. You said you put him on the lowest dose possible. I'm a surgeon. I said, well, maybe you should send him to me, and I do a Nissen on him to decrease their acid exposure. Do you think that's appropriate? Oh, Pimentel hates surgeons. He's not sending him to a surgeon. <laughs> yeah. What do you think? No, Go ahead. I, I, my brother is a surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Well, Jeff, I think that's a good idea. I think it's a good idea to uh, do whatever you can to reduce the amount of acid there. But if I can get it done with PPIs, I, don't, I would not send that person for a fundification. Uh, if, the, if the PPIs are not working, and you are going to run into cases where it doesn't work. If that happens, then yes, then, then that is a good option. In so fact, what's your definition of not working? Your definition is progression? If I, see, uh, if I see endoscopic evidence of esophagitis or ulceration despite maximal PPI <coughs> excuse me, and lifestyle changes, you know, you have to tell these patients to raise the head of the bed two to six inches. That's very important. Oh, come on. No eating before or three. Yes, they have to do that. <laughs> This is a. This is the thing that gets the biggest frowns in the office. I think yeah. when I say that the wife slides off the bed. The wife slides off the bed. I think first of all, you have to get rid of the satin sheets. It has to be cotton or something that can give you traction. Otherwise, you're going to slide off the bed. But they they have to elevate the the head of the bed and they have to stop eating for three hours before they go to sleep. Uh, these are things that make a big big difference. Uh, there are some other, uh, some other uh, clinicians may want to use caraphate at bedtime, which can coat the mucosa some as well, but it is striking what happens to the esophageal mucosa once you start taking the inflammation away. So it's interesting that I just want to add that there have actually been some studies to show that uh, anti-reflux surgery probably is not better than high-dose PPIs and preventing progression of Barrett's. So it's not, Barrett's is not an indication in and of itself for anti-reflux surgery. The one small area that that's debated, and Jeff Peters and Tom Demeester looked at, was short segment Barrett's, where they thought that if you had less than three centimeters, maybe you got a little bit of reversal of short segment Barrett's with anti-reflux surgery, but that's debated. All right, so let's go on with this story. I'm going to lead you along a little bit here. So this patient now progresses to now high-grade dysplasia, and you've got him on maximum PPIs. You well, do the bi- over, You skipped over low-grade dysplasia. That, that oh, I thought we, all right, so we're at low-grade dysplasia. So <laughs> now you've got low-grade, yeah, you're right, Shiva. You're, so we're at, we're at uh, low-grade dysplasia now. What do you want to do for this patient now? What? You're sort of taking my thunder away here. Can I, can I start with my case? Oh, I know, you, I just I, want to uh, bug you a little bit. Okay, well, we'll work okay. through your cases okay. and do it, but I want to, Make a point. Uh, okay. Uh, so, go ahead. Low grade dysplasia. Let's do your do cases. It. Very good question. Very good question. And this is certainly something that gets uh, pulses uh, raising during debates. In fact, we had we posed this uh, question to uh, two um, uh, clinical uh, endoscopist experts in Barrett's esophagus uh, uh, a couple of years ago in our GI hepatology symposium, and they had a debate, which I think was the best session of the entire. Uh, entire uh, symposium and uh, so should we how should should we treat low-grade dysplasia how should we treat it well it really all depends on what is your risk for having a cancer so a few years ago when uh, the first studies that were population-based came out uh, displaying that your rate of progression may be as low as one in 200 per year uh, really the, the community uh, said you know, we don't need to treat these people why should we treat somebody if your risk is so low you can continue the survey? Well, that started to change. And uh, more recent uh, different studies that were done with different methodology, looking at patients who had low-grade dysplasia, who were treated with uh, radiofrequency ablation, and looking at their rates of progression to malignancy and high-grade dysplasia prospectively found a significant difference in progression. And so right now, there is good evidence for arguing for uh, treatment of low-grade dysplasia in Barrett's esophagus. And we have 
uh, reliable methods of doing this with uh, very minimal uh, side effects. So, so in low-grade dysplasia, I currently advise patients to get well, the treatment. You're opening up a can of worms. I, now I understand why you're saying that uh, you know, every time you bring up that topic, people are, you know, get a you know, heated debate. Now, in, in, for radiofrequency ablation, what is your uh, rate of complication? Would you say it's 1%? I mean, not yours personally, just people doing it. 1% or let's say so, half percent? Uh, strictures well, um, you're bringing up a, that's a good point but yes so what is the complication you're talking about for for example because if i because the documented cases of stricturing around five percent or so bleeding rate maybe one percent or less but you know you have to put that in context uh bleeding rate is probably less than one percent in real life mm -hmm. the risk of uh, stricture formation significant stricture formation is less than that five percent in our experience in our center i think it's far less than that so your, um, the, the bigger question is, actually, this is something that's going to come and, and haunt us later, is uh, we're pretty good at getting rid of low-grade dysplasia with radiofrequency ablation right now. But the thing is, it's coming back. Mm -hmm. It's coming back. So after a few years of you treating it, now we're finding that it's coming back and we're going to need to retreat these people. And how long do we keep this going? And are these people who get retreated year after year, maybe 20, 30 years of treatment, are they going to start getting significant strictures that we're not going to be able to manage endoscopically? So for the audience's sake, while you guys argue, I want to just show the video, uh, a commercial video, so they understand what Barrex is. Mm -hmm. So what you see here is Barrett's esophagus, and let me just describe this as what it is. The, the Barrex probe is a radio frequency probe with a balloon. It's wires around a, a balloon. And you step on it, you measure where the Barrett's is, you step on the probe for one second and it causes a mucosal burn of a, a few millimeters. Then you, you scrape this eschar away, you just scrape it away and immediately apply a second burn. This is what it looks like, the probe. And the, the probe has these little wires around it. We're going to show it to you uh, in water in one second. The generator, this is the generator that goes with it. And I think it's important to show this to everybody. And here's how you, you uh, position the uh, balloon. You have, first of all, you measure the balloon size. Make sure you get the right size balloon. And you inflate the balloon. Uh, here it is inflated. And then you step on it. You'll see a little disruption in the video when we step on it. It takes one second. Here it is. There is the disruption. And now you deflate the balloon and you'll see this white eschar. First, this is in slow motion in a saline bath. So you can see what happens in the balloon when it's discharged. It's in three portions. And that's it. That takes one second. And uh, this is the eschar immediately after. Uh, and it destroys the mucosa. Now, you then scrape this off and do it again immediately. Uh, the two studies that were done have shown that up to several years is over almost 90% uh, ablation here. There are some islands occasionally uh, that do remain. And then you go back with a, a smaller device that's called the Halo 90 and just touch up those devices. And I think this has been sort of revolutionary. Uh, and I'll stop this here. This has been revolutionary in the treatment of Barrett's. Uh, there are other ways. Uh, there are other ways to treat uh, Barrett's esophagus, including uh, liquid nitrogen, uh, which has been able to target uh, as well, and also photodynamic therapy, which is like <coughs> hitting a sledgehammer with a mosquito. You know, a mosquito with a is sledgehammer. Anyone, anyone still doing photodynamic therapy for Barrett's esophagus? Not with this new technology available. Mm -hmm. I would say. Because the problem that they had with that was that there was a significant amount of stricturing that they noticed. With photodynamic therapy, it's uh, using a WMD instead of a surgical strike. Exactly. Yeah. No, I agree yeah. 100%. <laughs> can, I, can I comment on the low-grade dysplasia comments so far? Oh, we want you, Johnny. Because, come on. Because trust me. He's shy. This He's is, a pathologist. This is all, no, I'm not shy. This is all, <laughs> this is all about the pathology. Um, I hate to say it. Of course. You know. uh, the studies of low-grade dysplasia are inherently all flawed uh, because the diagnosis of low-grade is so inherently um, variable. I mean, the CAPA statistic, measuring inner observer variability in that diagnosis is, I mean, I'm ashamed to say it because I'm a pathologist, but it's huge. So I don't know how you can trust 
studies of the natural history of low-grade dysplasia when the diagnosis is so questionable. I only trust the studies where multiple pathologists looked at, looked at cases in a blinded fashion mixed with cases that were negative and high-grade where there's a uniform agreement on that diagnosis. Those are the only trustworthy studies. Otherwise, you don't know what you're studying. So what are you <laughs> saying? Is, is, can you tell low grade from high grade? Yeah, you can tell low grade from high grade, but, but I mean, even if I see thousands of these a year, even within myself, I'm gonna have some variability looking at the same case over a period of time. So that's just the way it is. Uh, but at least to understand and to trust a case of low grade dysplasia, and that's what you're studying, it has to be reviewed, but there has to be multiple pathologists on a study for this to mean anything. So I don't even pay attention to studies without a pathologist so on it. So let me just ask you a question, Jonathan. Yeah. You would agree that we should treat dysplasia? Um, so, so I guess here's the second point of low-grade dysplasia. From a pathologist standpoint, you can come at low-grade dysplasia from two directions. You can work your way up to it and say, oh, okay, it might be low-grade, or you can work your way down basically where you're struggling between low and high and you say okay it's not good enough to be high it's low the latter situation is real those patients must be treated and RFA I think is a fabulous way to treat those patients the first one I'm dubious as to whether it really represents low grade um, and I don't know whether those patients need to be treated but the fact of the matter is there to me there's two forms of low if that makes any sense so let me go into a different thing that's been bugging me for a few years okay. as somebody who has done Barrex why not treat everybody who has Barrett's? <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I mean, that's a subject yeah, I have had people come to me who have Barrett's. Mm -hmm. and they I have done some patients who have non-dysplastic Barrett's. And they've come to me as friends. Some of them have worked for the company. Mm -hmm. And they say to me, look, I don't want to live with this specter over my head. I'm willing to go for the biopsies every two years, but please treat me and get rid of most of it. So, and there's the worry about buried glands and all of that, and we agree with that, and there's a small chance of a stricture, but they're easy to dilate strictures. So the question is, and I have this question, why not treat all patients with Barrett's? Well, the question is, are you treating the patient or the, or the physician, is the question, because unless you can show that treating low-grade dysplasia decreases mortality, you know, unless you can prove that you're saving lives, like in lung cancer and LSD trial, where they showed that getting routine CAT scans decreased the rate of death. You know, unless you can show that, the question is, what are you treating? Yes, there's a lesion. Yes, it can progress. It can, in some people, progress to high-grade dysplasia. But treating everybody and without showing that there's actually, I'm not saying it's not worthy of study. I'm just saying it's not worthy of practice as a routine practice yet. So we it's could use a large randomized time. trial on this. That. That's, that's very reasonable. However, it is not ready for prime time not to yet. be treating it for low-grade dysplasia because at present, even if you talk about a risk, overall risk profile of either stricture, bleeding, or something else, perforation thrown in the mix of 1% or less, if you are talking about a disease that progresses less than 1% or less, you are creating, with a complication that is about 1%, I would ask you, how are you helping? You know, how, how, are you, how are you proving that you're helping somebody? It's, uh, I'm not saying it's not worthy of study. I think that you should be careful using that technology. Ronnie, were well, you well, saying? I think that the SGE and the AGA came with position papers that not Barrett, all Barrett's are created equal. And when you're talking about Barrett's over 11 centimeters in length, the progression per year is a little different. Uh, that's what they, some cases you can debate if it's reasonable or not to, to ablate non-dysplastic barriers, but in general, we should not be doing that. And even in low-grade dysplasia, again, the risk of progression is questionable. One of the things I do, and I agree with uh, Dr. Goldblum, I mean, people in community don't have the benefit of having Dr. Goldblum around. But when I see people in the, in the, in the office, before I put them to an endoscopy, and they have significant reflux, I'm doing an endoscopy looking for barriers. I put them in high-dose PPI and I scope them eight weeks later, six weeks later, trying to minimize somebody telling me that there's a low-grade dysplasia, that they don't know if this is inflammatory or not, and then you open all these kind of worms. And the same thing, we get a patient from the outside coming from a second opinion for Barrett's, low-grade, the first thing is we get the slides, we review it here, we even send it to Dr. Goldman, we need to, we put it on PPI and we re-biopsy them. And even with a persistent low-grade dysplasia, we sit down and talk to the patient that the that the monster of cancer in low-grade dysplasia is not as big as uh, the TV says. I think your point about the total surface area of Barrett's is a great point. 
And I also think that your point about calming the esophagus down before the biopsies is a real learning point here. I think that's a great idea, mm -hmm. and I'm going to start to adopt it. I really like that because it, it gets rid of inflammation as a con confounding factor there. Mm -hmm. So let me go on and, and talk about high-grade dysplasia, and then we'll go ahead and do the cases. And here, I'm, I'm glad I'm not sitting next to Dr. Raja <laughs> because he's a thoracic surgeon, and I'm a GI yeah. surgeon, foregut mm -hmm. surgeon, and I'm an endoscopist primarily, so mm -hmm. I have to sit away from him on this because I used to give the board examinations in surgery when they used to let me, and the, and the point was when we used to ask the question about high-grade dysplasia, mm -hmm. you know, we followed Barrett's and did biopsies, and then we got high-grade dysplasia, and Tom DeMeester said 40-some percent of the time they had some sort of... A, at least 40% of the time, they had an intramucosal cancer somewhere right. in that esophagus. And that meant the patient had to get a total esophagectomy at that mm -hmm. time. Those yeah. answers yeah. have changed now. They have changed both, I think, in general surgery and in thoracic surgery. Good. Okay. Not only for Barrett's dysplasia, but also for intramucosal cancer. It's okay not to, you know, operate. I mean, there are obviously exceptions <laughs> to the rule where, you know, failure of therapy, extent of disease, all of those things come into play. But we don't anymore, we don't... Uh, do esophagectomies for high-grade dysplasia anymore, even though the previous studies did show that, you know, it was anywhere from 20 to 50 percent with the real rate somewhere around 25 to 30 percent rate of intramucosal cancer in resective specimens. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's not that there isn't cancer, it's a marker of cancer, <laughs> of, uh, you know, marker of badness, if you will, overall. But these days, you know, since we have some other effective therapies that are as good as getting rid of it, at least, you know, um, without all the complications, you know, it's reasonable to go down that road first. So what we would do in those patients, let mm -hmm. me clarify for the audience, if it was a nodular lesion, you'd resect it. If it was mm -hmm. other, and then the rest of the esophagus would be ablated. Is that right? Correct, yes. You, okay. would, you would resect the uh, lesion. If you don't have, if it's only a biopsy proven cancer without obvious lesion, then you would probably ablate all the, the entire area that's affected with Barrett's. If there's a nodular lesion, you resect it and most likely let it uh, heal first and then ablate the rest of the esophagus. I'm trying as opposed to ablating the esophagus immediately after resecting the nodule. So if a patient has had yeah. Barrick's ablation, yes. how do you follow them? You, that's a very good question. It's, it's, uh, you know, <laughs> we're doing serial endoscopies at the moment and uh, you know, uh, we're looking for multiple negative biopsies to show that we've ablated them, but then they have to fall back in the same pathway of, of being followed for Barrick's uh, dysplasia. <laughs> because you know, they have at-risk <coughs> mucosa. You can change, the, um, you can change the, the mucosa, but I'm not necessarily <coughs> sure that you can change the risk factors that they've been exposed to or the underlying genetic or epigenetic changes that have already happened in the mucosa that subsequently lead to Barrett's esophagus. And that's the reason why Tolga is seeing people come back years later with recurrent Barrett's. You know, you do have the same risk factors, plus you also have the epithelium that has been shown to be at risk. So it's not normal mucosa, even though it looks normal. I think that's what we're, uh, people are starting to find out. Do you ever do fundal applications in any of your high-grade dysplasias? I do them after they've been ablated and they've shown that they no longer have um, high-grade dysplasia because I think it helps the mucosa heal back to as close to a normal mucosa as possible. And that's the only area that I personally think that, you know, fund application for the treatment of Barrett's esophagus uh, <coughs> makes sense. Treating fund, uh, fund application for the purpose of treating dysplasia in and of itself, it doesn't make any sense to me only because it's a procedure that has limited longevity, meaning that if you do it on a 25-year-old to expect that at age 65 that fund application is going to work as well as that at 65 and everybody is not necessarily true. Two, it's a procedure that has side effects. So in this day and age where proton pump inhibitors are very effective, doing surgery with some side effects may not be the right thing to do, especially when there's no proven data to show. I know that there are some studies that have shown some potential benefit, but no definitive benefit in reversing Barrett's esophagus, either with PPI or with surgery. So, um, th so that's the only scenario where I've done fund application is, is this. But I must say there is, um, it is technically a little bit more challenging to do a fund application after a Barrett's esophagus, even though, at least it's been my experience, compared to people who have not had a Barrett, um, an ablation, is because there's some additional minor scarring, and nothing that prevents you from doing it, 
but you can tell that something has been done to that area. Interesting. Yeah. That's interesting. All right, I want to go back to Tolga and have you do your cases now, Tolga. You remember you had cases? <laughs> yes, I do. I have Stick with me, Tolga. I know you're people. tired, but I want you to stick with me here. But th this is going to get Siva's blood boiling, so I'm, I'm really, really looking forward to sharing this. Oh, good, good, good. We want blood boiling. Come on, let's go. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so... Can you see my, um, there we go, thank you. So this is a 70-year-old gentleman with a 10-year history of Barrett's esophagus at the GE junction. Biopsy shows low-grade dysplasia. Uh, this was in early 2013. That was the first time that um, it showed low-grade dysplasia. So this is, so this is uh, going back to the, uh, the excellent point that was made earlier about uh, uh, the duration of the uh, patient's uh, uh, low-grade dysplasia and if it is uh, coming up or coming going down. Um, and uh, so this is the first time it's been diagnosed, 2013, and what would you do next? I guess that's the question that I propose to the uh, participants. Would you continue surveillance in six months? Would you do an endoscopic ultrasound? Would you do radiofrequency ablation? Would you do a mucosal resection? There is no nodularity there. Would you, do, would you increase the PPIs to twice a day and re-biopsy, or would you obtain slides to review by two expert GI pathologists? So as we discuss this, I, I, uh, I think that John said already, we got to get two guys to look at this, right? That would be my choice. Yeah, you know, as a pathologist, he wants more guys <laughs> going to work. So he's going to put another pathologist to work and let him look at the slides. I have to say that I think that's really important. Um, and then the, uh, Ronnie I would increase the PPIs and re-biopsy. He mentioned that inflammation can confound the diagnosis. And uh, there's nothing really to EMR, you said, because there's no nodular lesion there. I'm just going through this. Yeah. I don't know the role of EUS and Barrett's. And so I want Tolga to tell me about the role of EUS and Barrett's. There isn't. This was a trick. trick uh, you didn't trick me. <laughs> All right. <laughs> There, you know, there was, there was some argument, argument made years ago for high-grade dysplasia patients to get endoscopic ultrasound, but uh, a, a, a good study showed that it, this was really not fruitful. Uh, so if you don't have an uh, established adenocarcinoma, endoscopic ultrasound is not likely to uh, help. Uh, the, um, so the, um, I think that some of the right answers, again, this is a complex issue, and the data is still trickling in. So I have uh, my uh, convictions on where it's headed and how I practice, but uh, I have to, you know, we have to say that is there's, there are several options here that are reasonable. One is to continue surveillance in six months, uh, increasing the PPIs and uh, rebiopsying is a reasonable approach. In our institution, uh, you know, we always obtain slides to be reviewed by two expert GI pathologists. That's the first next step for us. Uh, we will, of course, go for uh, rebiopsying uh, uh, most of the time, so uh, depending on what the patient prefers, of course, but uh, it, that's a good time to make sure that if there was any inflammation in the uh, endoscopy that we increase their PPIs and make sure to suppress really all the acid so that when we go back again, it says, uh, it says there's as little inflammation as possible because, again, this is the one thing that uh, creates the biggest uh, difficulty in uh, low-grade dysplasia uh, interpretation uh, is, is the inflammation. Am I, am I right? That's correct. Right. Yeah. The less inflamed it is, Thanks. the less we can uh, confuse regenerative changes with dysplasia. Okay. Right. So this slide, this slide will get some blood boiling because after discussing everything, and the standard discussion I have with the patients is that, you know, the field is evolving. There are uh, more of us are starting to think that low-grade dysplasia, uh, you would benefit from uh, ablation of low-grade dysplasia. There's, data, there's some data that's coming out that is good study that, that came out that showed that if you ablate a low-grade dysplasia, you are decreasing risk of progression to high-grade dysplasia and malignancy. And, uh, but the choice, but it's absolutely reasonable to continue to do surveillance. And uh, I have to tell you that um, even in those, most patients will uh, want to do the ablation, but in those patients who I have who say, let's just watch it, what ends up happening is they come back, you know, six months later, we biopsy, it says low-grade dysplasia, come back six months later, we biopsy, 
it says low grade dysplasia and six months later they're like you know what i can't take it anymore i don't want to deal with this i just ablate it and this is a this is what happens the vast majority of the patients that i have with low grade dysplasia and uh, it isn't uh, i don't think it's treating the physician to ablate at that point um, so this patient actually had um, Ablation done in uh, July 2013 and then in December 2013. This is what the ablation looks like uh, after the um, uh, after we ablate. So this is what it looked like prior to the. Uh, uh, this is what it, this is what the GZ line looked like, and this is after the first set of ablation. This is after the. This is what the ablation looked like uh, the second time around. So when the patient came back in February, and I bring them back in eight to twelve weeks. Uh, I re-biopsied at that time because the Z-line looked actually pretty good. But to my surprise, this time there was low-grade dysplasia and there was some high-grade dysplasia. So, uh, but this again, I mean, this is a spectrum and there's, there's variances in interpretation of grades of low-grade dysplasia. The, um, but when you're telling a patient you went from low-grade dysplasia to high-grade dysplasia, the first thing they're thinking is, oh my God, even though I'm getting treatment, I'm heading towards cancer now. And uh, this, that becomes a tough conversation to have, which, which, which we, do, we do see, you know, from time to time. The, in that setting, uh, we discussed that, you know, now we need to be very careful and go back and take a good look. Uh, and, uh, and there's one uh, point that I really want to make about this, uh, but I'm going to make that after the audience uh, chimes in and what they would do with the next step. Would you repeat RFA? Would you just repeat the biopsies in three months? Would you do EOS at this point, or would you do a mucosal resection? Did you see any nodules when you did this? Thank you. That, that's the point that I was going to make. So whenever I see high-grade dysplasia, I am very concerned that there's a nodularity somewhere. And this is something that, uh, that uh, those of us who see a lot of uh, Barrett's esophagus uh, uh, notice that if you're really carefully examining vast majority of the time with high-grade dysplasia, you're going to see a nodularity. So the concern that I had at this point was there was there, there was there a nodularity that I didn't see, that I missed that, but I just happened to randomly biopsy that area. Now we're seeing high-grade dysplasia. And, um, and if there's a nodularity, is radiofrequency ablation the right thing to do? Um, what do you think? What do you think, Jeff? Me, I think that if there's a nodularity, you should do an EMR and then do ablation. I think you got to, you don't go deep enough with the, uh, yes. with the RFA to get the whole nodule. It only goes a millimeter or so. That's that's right. That's exactly um, that's exactly. Right. I'm going to actually, I have a slide on that later on at, at the very end. So in this case, uh, we did a mucosal resection. I when I uh, actually went down and looked at uh, when I brought him back about a month or so later and took a look at that area. I did see a nodule there. I did a mucosal resection of it and it just came back esophagitis. The, um, the rest of the, and I did biopsies and I mapped it out at that point. Uh, and, and what I do with this, and this is something that uh, is a trick for everyone who does mucosal uh, biopsies in, in these types of settings is, um, uh, it's just I'm just very methodical about it. So I actually orient the scope the, the way that I usually do, and I and I start taking bites from 12 o'clock, you know, one or two o'clock, and three o'clock, five o'clock, and it each goes into a separate bottle. So I map the G junction so that when I go back again, if I find that it's along a certain area, I'm concentrating more on treating that part. Um, and uh, so and this coming back as esophagitis was. Uh, was surprising, but then again, you know, I think this was a case where I, maybe I talked myself into seeing a nodule, and, and, or there was a nodule, but it was just an inflammatory nodule, and this was just one of those cases of, you know, uh, this uh, dysplasia with, uh, with, between low grade and high grade, and, and uh, you know, the, it was hedged on the high grade side. Tolga, I want to ask so you what we're looking at there. Uh, we're retroflex there, aren't so, we, looking at that? Yes. Oh, yes, yes, thank you. So this is something I do quite often. I, if there's a hiatal hernia, and almost always there is a hiatal hernia, I, will, I get a very, very good view on a retroflex view in the hiatal hernia of the, G, of the Z line. And in fact, with uh, the, uh, the newest generation of the Olympus scopes, you can even do something called the near focus. 
which can give you very, very high detail if you're just a few millimeters from the edge. And you can see areas of, uh, of uh, patterns of mucosa that look, that really correspond very closely to areas of adenocarcinoma. And also, uh, you can see areas of uh, what, you, what end up being Barrett's when we would biopsy them. And you can start to see some disorganization in certain glands that often end up becoming areas of high-grade dysplasia. It's really, it's not so much these elongated looking, villous looking areas that end up being displaced. It's the more uh, flatter and disorganized, almost swirly appearance of the, uh, of the mucosa that ends up being the higher displaced. Um, but uh, thanks for uh, bringing that up. Uh, so this patient has radio frequency ablation. And then on follow up in July, biopsies showed just esophagitis. And I brought him back. Uh, he came back about six months later, and then it showed low-grade dysplasia again. So what would be your next step at this point? So we've been working on this patient for quite some time, and uh, uh, I know Dr. Raj is chuckling right now because he would have just left him alone to begin with. But um, we've done ablation. We've done a mucosal resection. The area continues to come back at this plastic. Uh, what, would, uh, what, would you, what would the panel do at this point? What do you think, Ronnie? What do you, what would you do? Would you pull out the frozen uh, liquid nitrogen at this point? Not a bad idea. I mean, you can uh, go to a different technique, but I don't think anybody has shown that cryo is better than RFA when RFA has failed. I think it all comes down to how you started. If you started with a low-grade displacement and you have submitted this patient through so many treatments and nothing has happened, probably... You know, you threw the curve about the high grade displeasure. Maybe it's a time to just back off and let it be. Um, survey them much less often if all this thing has yeah. failed. So the um, uh, this is the um, th this is what we this is just a slide showing exactly what uh, I did for this patient, uh, taking us through the esophagitis and low grade displeasure. And, and when I brought him back uh, uh, about two months ago, I did cryo, and uh, and so. There is, this has been difficult to accumulate, this, this data. And it's, it, there is data from, there is, I mean, a lot of us have noticed that if somebody fails radiofrequency ablation, they tend to respond to cryo. And we, we've also had cases where the reverse we've seen, where for some reason, uh, if you started with cryo and it's not working, you used to keep having these islands that are not being treated. And if you switch the radiofrequency ablation, it works better. We don't quite understand why, and this may, the, the data, is, data is still very young on this, but they are being gathered, and there is, uh, there is some thought that if, you're not, if your uh, rate of frequency ablation is failing, switch to, um, uh, switch, to switch methods to liquid nitrogen. So this is pending, so maybe on, at, the, at the next, if I'm invited to the next one, maybe I can share with you what happens with this patient. Uh, but uh, he did receive uh, cryotherapy in this area. Hey, Tolga, um, let me ask you a question. I mean, since you are going along with, with this philosophy that, you know, that low-grade dysplasia is, uh, is hazardous to the health, and you've done, uh, bar you've done ablation, you've done cryo, now let me ask you this. If he came back and you still had low-grade dysplasia, uh, what are you going to do? Let's say you're not able to eradicate low-grade dysplasia. Uh, where is this going to lead to? Is it going to lead to an esophagectomy? Are we now going back into in thinking that this would be, this is a lesion that is that worrisome that we're, if we keep doing something for it, it makes one wonder, is this something that we're concerned enough to ultimately eradicate it? If you can't eradicate yeah. it, would you that's then it. go that's to the next level, which is taking it out? That's a great point. That, that's exactly why I'm sharing this mm -hmm. case, because uh, if we are, uh, as we embark on more and more ablations of these patients with uh, low-grade dysplasia, we are going to run across cases like this where it's looking great, and then you biopsy it, and uh, we're seeing low-grade dysplasia, and you're sort of throwing the kitchen sink at them, and you can't get rid of the low-grade dysplasia. And you, you bring up an excellent point, and this is exactly what I wanted to, to discuss with this case, is uh, where do we stop? I mean, at, the, at what point should we be actually just stopping all the ablative methods and just surveying this patient. So my personal uh, uh, discussion with my, with my patient and the decision that uh, we made was to try cryoablation therapy, and if it doesn't look like it's making a significant impact, then we're going to go back to surveying. 
because I certainly believe that this person needs to be surveyed very closely, and we don't want to cause significant uh, stricturing by being overly aggressive with either uh, method. There, some may argue, actually, that you know you need to do uh, a, a, either a partial or a complete circumferential EMR or, or ESD of that area, but I, I think that that would be way too aggressive. And I think that um, in somebody who's already shown that they may be progressing to high grade at some point, we just need to be very careful with this patient. Devil's so this advocate. is not your local that showed, out of no, showed up out of nowhere, and uh, just only one biopsy showed it, and the rest of it has been okay. We've seen that he may be progressing. So let me just be devil's advocate here. Um, if it keeps going, uh, you could do EMR. You could do, uh, you could do what they do in Japan, which would be an ESD, and remove all of that tissue. So uh, what do you think about that? So I think that ESD, you know, there isn't much experience with ESD after uh, uh, RFA or cryo. I don't know if there's any experience with ESD after cryo, actually. Um, and because we are causing deeper and deeper injury uh, with uh, each uh, subsequent ablation, even though radiofrequency ablation may not be going uh, very deep, it does. we do think it does get to, there is some effect on the submucosa. Cryo has been shown to be deeper. We think it does go to the submucosa, maybe even the muscularis, but the muscle survives much better than the, uh, the more superficial tissues. So it may be very difficult to do ESD on patients who have had this type of treatment. Did you use, and, uh, did you use I, the balloon or did you Jeffrey, use... I think that... Uh, go ahead. ...went to this dead end and you started not necessarily with the right foot. I think this patient just need to be surveyed. If you find some nodules with high-grade dysplasia, you can do uh, EMRs every so often, or you just wait until something severe happens that surgery is uh, warranted. Yeah. Other than that, I, I think you're going to be treating this patient for something that the end point is not clear, if it's right. just low-grade dysplasia. Right. Yeah. Tolga, did you use the right. Halo 90 or the balloon when you re-ablated? <coughs> so at... So at the G junction, it's it's difficult to get a full apposition with a balloon. Right. And I, if there's a, a, a lesions at the G junction, I use either the Halo 90 or now you can also use the through the channel catheter. And with that one, you actually have very good direct vision of where you're burning uh, with a through the channel catheter, and you can put a cap on it, which can uh, give you some additional uh, visibility. The, um, so you have to be, and, and what you'll find is even when you ablate long segments of, of, of Barrett, as, as soon as you start getting down to the, you know, you'll do a great job of ablating the tubular esophagus, but when you get down to the G junction, you're going to have multiple patches because the, your balloon is usually too small for that lower part, and, uh, and, uh, and it moves around so much that you may not actually get a very good ablation. Okay. Tolga, you want to do your next case? Yeah, thank you. So this is a case of a 68-year-old gentleman with a large hiatal hernia and a C8-M8 nodular Barrett's esophagus with high-grade dysplasia. So that is the, um, that is the, uh, the special is classification for defining uh, the the extent of uh, Barrett's with regards to how much of it is circular, how much of it is um, uh, is uh, like an extent above the circular part. So it, it can be very difficult sometimes to define just in words uh, how it is. But this is a, a part. Of, this is called the Prague classification. So C means circular, and M means the maximal extent. So if you have a, a C8M10, that means that uh, eight centimeters from the G junction is circular, and then there's about a two centimeter tongue above that. Um, so this patient has a long segment of Barrett's. It, prior to, uh, I saw this, before I saw this patient, he had partial band EMR performed in early 2013, uh, which was aborted due to, due to significant bleeding. I think six clips were placed in the part of the esophagus where the nodularity had been noted. Um, so let me give that to you with that background. So when I did the, uh, uh, the endoscopy annotation, the, this is, is the distal esophagus, and you can see there's a polypoid lesion 
in the distal esophagus, and there's nodularity all around. And you can see this is a, a, a pulling the scope mat back more proximally. This is the esophagus, believe it or not. I know it looks like the stomach or the colon, but he has a very large esophagus with significant nodularity. And this is another uh, look at the esophagus. And there, there's actually a tattoo mark here where it had been placed before. This is something that uh, um, I would discourage you to do, uh, tattooing in this area, and I think Ronnie may disagree with me on this, but it's, it causes significant scarring when you place uh, India ink tattoo. And if you're going to do a, um, a mucosal resection later on, this is really going to make it hard for you, especially if you're considering at all doing an ESD. It's going to make it very, very hard for you to do that. Um, so management options. This is a long segment of, esophag uh, of the esophagus with high-grade dysplasia. Um, uh, options are surgical referral, doing an endoscopic ultrasound, uh, a complete EMR, which means we go back and try to do EMR on the rest of it, uh, circumferential ESD for on-block resection, or uh, cryoablation, because we know it goes a little deeper, or uh, hiatal hernia repair with fund application and surveillance. That's a nice case. It's uh, something you don't want to see very often. Uh, nope. Again, we could go through this again. Uh, the surgical referral, you mean thoracic surgery, or somebody who's going to do yes. esophagectomy. That's what we're really talking about there. And the question yes. of EUS, even though we dismissed it, out of hand last time, in this case, there's some kind of a lesion there. So I think maybe EUS might be interesting in this sort of patient because he's got a, a, a thing you can see there. Yeah. And uh, so I would, uh, inter I would do EUS. Uh, well, let me ask you this, Dr. Yeah. Kosky. If the EUS was negative, okay, or negative for any kind of deep invasion, but in the absence of, if you have an esophagus with a lot of nodularity, a lot of high-grade dysplasia, so that's something you can't take out. Does it matter? I mean, good whether. question. It's just staging. Okay, that's all I'm saying. The EUS in this case tells me whether I got more disease than I suspected. Right. That's yeah. all I'm saying. Um, Fair enough. I'd also get a CT scan to make sure he doesn't sure. have liver metastases. <laughs> but, sure. <laughs> but I think I do the EUS. It's really funny that I've become such a believer in EUS because 20 years ago I thought it was like watching grass grow, and it's really become a wonderful adjunct to everything we do. And uh, so I would do an EUS if I had a big lesion like that. But I think your point is well taken. We've tried very hard in this guy. And uh, there is a, a yeah. new technique out where people are actually grafting gastric mucosa up onto the base of a big ESD. I'm not sure that's great because that's still columnar epithelium. And it's, you know, it's not perfect. But... Sorry, now they're putting acid-producing mucosa in the middle of the esophagus? <laughs> Jurgen. Okay, just, check, just, yep. just checking. Yep. Let's make sure I heard it right. It's true. Okay. Actually, we've had the well, idea of putting a skin graft in there from the thigh, mm -hmm. which would give you squamous epithelium. So it isn't, just because the, if, it, if you could prove it's just mucosal and you could remove the mucosa, mm -hmm. you could graft it with something squamous, sure. that would be okay. Yeah. And right actually, here, the, uh, the skin does very well, actually, in the lumen. We actually... Uh, you know, in reconstructive uh, esophageal surgery, we use uh, skin flaps, you know, free flaps right. with skin on them. And when you scope them, they have hair growing in there and whatnot, but so, uh, uh, it seems to be fine. Right, so we've know, actually had the idea. Stick. My friend Jeff Marks yeah. and I have worked yeah. on the idea mm -hmm. of putting skin graft on the outside of an expandable metal stent that we could remove and letting it graft after you do an ESD. It's just an idea, Damn. but uh, better than columnar. The only I issue think. with that, I, was, I would suspect, I mean, have you got it to work? The only, issue, the only issue with that is that when you do an ESD, you use electrocautery at the base, okay? Yeah. So you've uh, sort of made that area ischemic. And then on top of that, to put a skin graft, which relies on, on diffusion to get its oxygen tension, uh, I, I, quite, I worry about that. Because normally when we skin graft, we put a vac dressing or something on a, on a base to create granulation, to create vascularity, and then graft it. Right. So that's my only uh, uh, It's concern. just an idea right now. You sure. know, if you're an endoscopist, you yeah. keep thinking of these ideas. <laughs> yeah. But the bottom line is we have a patient with recalcitrant advanced disease. It's pretty ugly. Mm -hmm. um, cryoblation is interesting. So did the audience vote on this one? Let's see. 13% picked hiatal hernia repair. Yeah, so with a hiatal hernia repair in and of itself, 
will not make this regress. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that that alone is enough. Yeah. ESD is uh, so interesting. So ESD. So you got an EUS there, Tolga. Uh, uh, I think yeah. as internists, as gastroenterologists or endoscopists, mm -hmm. we need to learn when uh, even uh, we love our tools, uh, some patients don't belong to us anymore. And uh, we need to know when this patient belongs to the surgeon, especially if the patient agrees to that. Uh, and not to go in through a path that's not going to need nowhere. I think if you have a high grade dysplasia nodule and low grade dysplasia around or something, you can EMR and then uh, burn. But you have a long area of high grade dysplasia nodular uh, esophagus, and a patient is a re reasonable surgical candidate, that's the guy that should meet and sit down with a surgeon and, and, and see what they have to do. So here I am as a surgeon arguing with a gastroenterologist against surgery. And I, mm -hmm. the interesting thing is esophagectomy is not the same as colectomy. It is not for sure. But that being said, I think a lot of the concerns that people have about esophagectomies are based off of old data. Historical mortality, you know, in the 1980s was probably, you know, a north of 10 percent in high in high volume centers. That may be the case in low volume centers even now. And you know, by the time we were in the 2000s, you were talking about a 4 percent, 5 percent mortality. Mm -hmm. Today, it's two to three percent in high volume centers for a, an operation of that size. For sure, it's not a, um, a lobectomy. Uh, it is not a colectomy. And it is a big operation for sure. Uh, there's plenty of data out there that says that there are a lot, lot of surgical patients, uh, surgical candidates for even higher uh, stage esophageal cancer that don't get surgical therapy because of the perception that it's such a high risk operation, it's a non-survivable operation, uh, that people are getting definitive chemoradiotherapy. Uh, and that's not true anymore. How's your quality of life? Because I don't see these patients as much the as The quality you. of life is, uh, is actually... Um, the quality of life is pretty good, that I, would, I would say. Now, you also have to take this into consideration. There was a paper that was uh, published a while ago that looked at quality of life at five years after esophagectomy, and they found that the quality of life was actually better. Now, there are various reasons why that could be the case in that they have five years, they've survived a, a life-threatening problem. So it, uh, for those reasons, they may believe that. There is a penalty, obviously, to be paid. There's lifestyle changes that have to be made. Um, there is, um, uh, you know, their functional status is a little bit less, but that being said, given the alternative in most cases, which is esophageal cancer progressing to death, um, mm. um, it, you know, people actually do just fine. They live normal lives, they go back to their jobs, they go back to their families, and uh, they do have to have surveillance, um, which once again is another scenario where we follow them for the rest of their lives for recurrence of Barrett's. Because now what you've done is you've taken the stomach and attached it to the esophagus high up, and there's still some mucosa that, even though it wasn't at risk before, it's now at risk because Do you ever see Barrett's develop up there? Yes, we do. We've seen cancer develop there. It's not very common, but we do surveil them, yes. Very interesting, because I didn't even appreciate that. Yeah. That's good. So, all right, so mm -hmm. Tolga, I want you to uh, finish up this case. With, uh, tell us what you did. Yeah. Yeah, so... Uh, I, I refer, I told him clearly that I, I thought that um, he, should, he should have surgery, but he, he didn't want to have anything to do with it. He, in fact, I sent him to two surgeons, uh, even at another institution. Everybody agreed he should go for surgery. He's young, he's in good shape, and he would do better. Uh, but the, he, does not, he did not want anything to do with it. So in, in, and I thought, having looked at these initial... Um, uh, these initial uh, images from the referring doctor that this nodule there, I, I said, this is almost certainly a malignancy. I mean, this is, the I said, I, I don't even really need to go in there. I know you have hygroid dysplasia. I know you have this horrible uh, uh, esophagus with, uh, um, with nodularity and a polyp growing in the middle of it. Uh, you already had attempted EMR. Things are scarred. Uh, but he really didn't want to have anything to do with it. I did a, um, an endoscopic ultrasound, thinking that this is probably going, there's a, the base of it is going through the wall, or it's, you know, expecting to see at least a T2 type of lesion, but it, but it wasn't. This was actually uh, quite superficial. I did a, a snare polypectomy of this pedunculated polyp, and uh, it came back low-grade dysplasia here. I kind of... I had now less ground to stand on with him, even though I kept telling him it doesn't negate the fact that he had high-grade dysplasia before, and you're, you're, you're very high risk for developing a malignancy. 
and um, you know, and uh, he said that you know, you know, we even discussed actually fund application, trying to reduce the amount of assets there. But I said, you know, this is not something you should have. We really should go for, uh, 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 you know, subjectomy essentially. But uh, again, you know, the, the the patient doesn't want that. He he wanted to try alternative methods. You know, I even spoke with the uh, the original person who had done these in a in a very prominent uh, Midwest institution who started the EMR, and we you know, discussed going back and doing a completion EMR versus uh, ESD. We thought that uh, I've even discussed this with uh, some of the ESD experts we have in this country about doing a circumferential ESD. Uh, but in the end, uh, he didn't really want to go along with any of the risks involved with those procedures, perforation risk, which would result in a surgery for him was uh, something that he was not willing to do. And uh, so the only uh, thing that I could, I, I often know I said, the only thing we could really do that may actually make an impact on this is cryo. It, is, it does have a deeper penetration. At least we can start concentrating on the distal esophagus where the high-grade dysplasia was noted. I did, of course, map him pretty extensively. Um, I think I think our pathologists may have been shocked at the number of bottles that they got from this location. <laughs> Somewhere in the order of, well, it was a lot of bottles. But anyway, he actually, uh, so we did uh, do cryo on him. Uh, you know, I was reluctant to do this uh, because I didn't really think that it was going to help much. But um, after we improved his um, acid control, really improved his acid control uh, medically and also with lifestyle changes, uh, this is his, uh, this was uh, this is what it looks like after uh, uh, one of his uh, after the first cryo uh, uh, ablation the nodularity significantly decreased uh, there is neosquamous mucosa and um, you can see in the farther up in the esophagus actually it, it looks far better I, I I have to say I I've been quite shocked this is actually just from earlier this month he's uh, this is a uh, he came back for his third. Uh, 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 cryoablation, and uh, this is working for him. I have to say, I, I was very, very uh, surprised at this. Um, I didn't think that it was going to end up uh, helping him. So uh, he's very happy with it. I, I still tell him there's still a risk of uh, having buried glands, as we had talked about. There's, it doesn't mean that this is going to completely go away, and we haven't completely gotten rid of the intestinal metaplasia down uh, near the G-junction. Um, and this is a very nice um, uh, cartoon that shows the depth of ablation injury by ablation technology. So uh, the rate of frequency ablation is the most superficial. Uh, this is with the treatment, so you burn once and you slough it off, and then you burn again. So I tell my patients, it's really basically I'm giving you a bad sunburn and then scraping it off and then burning it again, and that gets it down to this layer uh, uh, in the mucosal layer. The, EMR gets down to the submucosa, as we know, and uh, we showed. Cryo is thought to, uh, in cadaver studies, go down to the bottom of the submucosa, close to the muscle layer. And there's uh, some, now there's some thought, there's some evidence that RFA actually goes down a little deeper, but it, it ends up being not a very meaningful injury. Uh, of course, surgery depth, the ultimate depth. Um, but in in this particular case, surprisingly, uh, cryo was helpful. Where would uh, where would PDT go on that? Uh, I, you know, I, I think the PDT is at least as deep as cryo. I, I um, and really, did, I base this mostly on the significant rate of stricturing that occurs with it. Right. Uh, so my but, question uh, is, would, have this, would this patient, because everything else has failed, been a candidate for PDT? Not that you want to use it very uh, often. That, that's the problem with PDT is, is, is with his segment and the amount of a... Uh, uh, he didn't want to risk, we had this discussion, and when I told him about the risk of uh, stricturing with PDD that would lead to multiple uh, endoscopy sessions to dilate or even maybe go to surgery, he did not want to have any of that. So sort of a, he's uh, really limited our options. It, it makes for an interesting uh, academic uh, case because these are questions we want answered ourselves. Is that can we manage people like him with something like cryo, but uh, he, has, uh, he has kind of put us in the situation where he hasn't really given us any other yeah. option. I think you've shown that cryo has an interesting effect. I also think that cryo is good in patients that have irregular or tortuous esophagus 
so that you can get the areas that you can't get with a balloon or even a halo. Yes, if you want... I think, to, I think that's the key with the crack. Now we're using the new machine, which the flow is much easier to use. I'm not convinced that the depth of injury is the difference. I think you can treat, especially crevices and area around the G junction, much more in a homogeneous way than with RFA, and probably that's why you get less islands afterwards or you may get rid of the island that with RFA you don't get there and it's very friendly it's very easy to use and you can do biopsies afterwards so uh, uh, I think it's a very good tool to have around okay Tolga you have another slide don't you? yeah oh no I think that this is it for me this is a uh, but there was there is there is some anatomic evidence that it does it does go deeper uh, in um, uh, there were some cadaver studies that were done at the University of Miami that showed this, and the and 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 some RFA studies that were done, in, especially in dosing studies, showed that it doesn't quite go as, as deep. But I agree with Ronnie. I mean, the 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 optimal place to use the uh, cryotherapy is I, I would list. This is my list. Uh, is uh, if you're if you're not if you're failing with RFA, that's one option. The other is if you have a very big esophagus, you know that your balloon is not going to have good apposition. Uh, and uh, thirdly, if you have a nodular uh, uh, esophagus where the, uh, the contact of the RFA uh, catheter and the probe is not going to be even on the surface. And we have also used this, both Ronnie and I have uh, used this on, on patients that are very old who have very superficial uh, adenocarcinoma uh, who who are high risk even for something like endoscopic mucosal recession. I mean, I even had one patient who couldn't come off of anticoagulation. We had to just treat with cryo because there's very low risk of bleeding with cryo. And uh, and so far, we we have we are gathering uh, some a population of very elderly patients who cannot tolerate anything else, and cryo has worked for them. I have one patient who was more than two years out with esophageal adenocarcinoma with no evidence of recurrence. All right, so I want to switch the discussion a little bit, and I want to ask Shiva, um, if you do an esophagectomy mm -hmm. for high-grade dysplasia in Barrett's, or even in this case with low-grade dysplasia that's recalcitrant, is it enough to just resect above the Barrett's into squamous mucosa, or do you have to do a total esophagectomy? I think functionally you have to do a... Um whatever esophagectomy you're going to do, meaning that... Uh, that doesn't tell me anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's different, there's so many different ways of doing an esophagectomy. There's a thoracoabdominal, which is you do a left-sided incision, and then there's an incision in the neck. You, that the esoph most of the esophagus is gone with the exception of maybe three or four centimeters of the esophagus. Uh, probably about 80% of the esophagectomies done in the United States are a type of esophagectomy called Ivor Lewis, which is where it's, uh, the incision is in the abdomen and the right chest, and the, and the connection or the anastomosis is in the right chest. They actually have probably anywhere from five to eight centimeters of esophagus left. The reason to do it the way we do it is for two reasons. One, from a functional standpoint, they, it works better because when you do an esophagectomy, the vagus nerves are gone. Now, people talk about sparing it, but it, you know, practically speaking, it doesn't work so well. So for all intents and purposes, with the vagus nerve gone, the gastric <coughs> function is very <coughs> poor. So uh, when you do an esophagectomy, you take out the esophagus, uh, you know, not only the disease area, but also high enough that you can then bring the stomach up and from a functional standpoint, you have enteric continuity where the food goes down the esophagus into the stomach and through the pylorus and onward, as opposed to having a big baggy stomach that's just sitting there that doesn't drain well. So you basically have gastroparesis at that point. So functionally, taking out only that area and then putting it back together doesn't work. Now, it can, people have done it and have gotten away with it sometimes, but as a routine practice, it doesn't. So you do an Ivor Lewis? We do um, uh, our anastomosis in the neck for technical reasons, but yeah. yes. So I had the other question. I understand going in the neck, mm -hmm. because if you have a leak, Correct. it's a less serious problem. Correct. And that's what we did for years, and now Ivor Correct. Lewis has gotten popular again. Mm -hmm. But the question I have is, is the nature mm -hmm. of the remaining squamous mucosa mm -hmm. different in patients who get Barrett's? You, you know, you mentioned that they can mm -hmm. get it again up at the area. Are these patients different than those who have cancer that you do the operation in? Well, I think if you have Barrett's, you have Barrett's, and that is abnormal mucosa. There's, I, I'm not familiar with any study that shows that uh, the squamous mucosa high up in the esophagus in someone who has Barrett's 
low down in the esophagus is, is abnormal for any other reason. You know? okay. so it's I would, not more susceptible. It's not more susceptible. However, the operation can be, uh, in and of itself, is a ulcer, or not ulcer, is a um, reflux generating operation. You no longer have a lower esophageal sphincter. You now have the, um, the gastric mucosa adjacent to the uh, squamous mucosa without any valve or any barrier. And two, um, because of the nature of the operation, where you have a pyloric drainage procedure, you not only expose the, the, the stomach, uh, the uh, esophagus, uh, the esophageal mucosa to some acid, but also to bile. So uh, it, is, it could get abnormal over time. So that's why we surveil these folks. Uh, you know, we essentially go down the road of uh, barrack surveillance, where we would do here at least, every three years for someone who has no abnormalities. Every three years we surveil their mucosa. And if obviously, if you have Barrett's, you go down the pathway of Barrett surveillance. So another, I want to flip this back mm -hmm. to the pathologist again and mm -hmm. say, we've, we've seen epidemiologically a whole change in esophageal cancer in this country. What we've seen is we've gone from squamous cell to uh, adenocarcinoma in Barrett's esophagus. Is there anything that we are doing to our patients that is causing this? Are PPIs causing this? Uh, is what, what do you think? Yeah, I've heard lots of theories. I'm not sure any of them make complete sense to me. Um, H. pylori, but there's actually an inverse relationship between an H. H. pylori cancer, and, right. and esophageal cancer. So I'm not sure it has anything to do with H. pylori. Or Yeah, I, I, don't, I, I don't know the explanation. The other interesting thing is, is related to proximal gastric cancer because it seems to be rising, you know, at least when you read the uh, literature, it says it's rising at the same rate as distal esophageal adeno, but to me, those are all distal esophageal adenos involving the proximal But stomach. you don't think PPIs are necessarily causing this? I don't know that there's I need evidence. an answer. I don't know that there's evidence to suggest <laughs> okay, that that's I'm true. The only other thing I wanted to comment on that right. I didn't have a chance to comment on is these post-RFA biopsies. Um, since we've been talking about RFA the whole time, and I've seen hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of post-RFA biopsies, and, and the interesting thing is they all come up as these superficial strips of squamous mucosa. I mean, there's basically no tissue beneath the squamous mucosa. So it always comes off as squamous mucosa, at least 99.9% .9 of the time, but because of the nature of the biopsies, it may be the scarring due to the RFA, and it comes off as this strip, you are absolutely not seeing any subepithelial uh, tissue, so there's no way to exclude, you know, subepithelial intestinal metaplasia. The berry gland situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's scary. How often are we seeing that now? I know that there used to be a problem uh, in photodynamic therapy, um, was that it grew, the, the glands had some uh, dysplasia, but then the squamous mucosa ended up covering it, and then deeper biopsies do end up showing it. Is that true now with the same frequency with uh, RFA? Are you guys noticing it? It's low. It's lower than it's lower than things like APC and PDT. It's mm -hmm. it's there. It's some estimated as high as five percent. I don't think so. I think it's mm -hmm. more more in the maybe two to three yeah. percent. But it gives it, it gives you great pause though. I mean, if you're you're because we do right now a visual follow up, and if you even if you see because the, and the esophagus mucosa is not totally flat, so you see these little blips and undulations, and you don't think that there's a gland buried underneath there. But I think that what's going to really happen is in, in, the, in surveillance of these patients, especially those with long segment barriers that had it treated with RFA or cryo, we're going to start to use uh, a technology uh, such as um, uh, the, the optical coherence tomography type of uh, technology where you can actually start to see buried glands under the squamous and then maybe target those areas for biopsy. Yeah, I think OCT, which gives you layer by layer, may be the way of the future here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All so right. I actually, I have one last question yeah. for Dr. Goldblum. Yeah. You know, um, these days, they're able to do a lot of genetic studies on very, very little, uh, um, you know, DNA or RNA. Yeah. You know, uh, in another lifetime, I had actually looked at uh, microsatellite instability, which is a marker of how abnormal a tissue is. And we had actually micro-dissected <laughs> um, uh, normal, normal squamous mucosa, uh, Barrett's dysplasia, Barrett's metaplasia, low-grade dysplasia, high-grade dysplasia, and intermucosal cancer. And if you looked at, we only looked at five or seven sites, sure. um, and you could see that the frequency of alterations in these 
commonly altered tumor suppressor genes increased in frequency with the increase in the uh, thing. Yeah. Now, but that was looking at a small amount of, of, um, uh, of, of sites and looking at a uh, you know, small, you know, large amount of tissue that all pulled together. But now it seems like you could get enough tissue from a couple of cells to get an answer from this. Are people now able to look at uh, genetic alterations yeah. to see if, is this something that is looking more like cancer or is this something that's looking like more like inflamed tissue to be able to make the distinction between dysplasia uh, uh, that is true versus dysplasia that is a, a phenomenon of, uh, of inflammation? Yeah, uh, it's an interesting question. Um, th this is generally true. Whatever biomarker anybody has ever looked at, the mm -hmm. frequency of the abnormality increases as you go from Barrett's negative to low grade to mm -hmm. high grade to cancer. Yeah. That doesn't really help us um, to assess dysplasia. Actually, mm -hmm. I think the real answer here is finding the biomarker that recognizes the patients that are Barrett's negative that are going to progress from the parents who are, from the patients who are Barrett's negative that are at no risk. Okay. And to me, that's, that's where the, the sort of the magic bullet is because most patients don't progress to cancer. You can ignore 99% of them. The problem is figuring out the 1% that need to be followed so if you can identify that marker in non-dysplastic Barrett's, that's actually what I'm more interested in. Uh, morphologic assessment of dysplasia is not perfect, but as of now, there's no biomarker that seems to be better mm -hmm. than a pathologist's eyes. I, I, you know, and so I what hope about there never can, is, actually. What about confocal <laughs> microscopy? Um, I don't know much about confocal <laughs> microscopy. So the, this whole idea of confocal microscopy means that instead of biopsying, yeah. We put this thing that looks like a yeah. microscope yeah. into the, into the yeah. esophagus, yeah. and then we can show you the cells <coughs> without taking them out, and we can go circumferentially, and, yeah. and then you can tell us what you yeah. see. Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, there are studies that have looked at this, and that probably has potential. I just have no personal experience with it. Yeah, I think we'll see more of that mm -hmm. in the future as well. Uh, I want to end up here with saying a few words to our audience. Uh, this was a first attempt a first uh, foray into an engagement series in which we plan to continue. Uh, we plan to say uh, we thank you to all of our uh, people who, who refer to us, who people who work with us both inside our institution and out. We want to engage you. We want you to be part of our educational activities to join us in this in the future. And we're going to try to reach out and get faculty from various sites that are affiliated with us in the future so everyone has a say and tell us what they do. Uh, this will be done first in the GI specialties, but then it will be done in almost every specialty at the clinic. And uh, we hope that it's entertaining and enlightening and worthwhile for you. This will be on the archives in the uh, website of the Cleveland Clinic for two years. And if you want, you can get CME credit for for this by signing up and then uh, d uh, telling them that you want to get CME credit. So there is a link in the right upper corner of your screen that tells you how to apply for CME credit. So with that, I just want to say one more word. I want to thank the studio personnel, the people from Globalcast MD who've worked very hard, the people in our studio who've been sweating this out all day long in the hot studio and behind the cameras, and to Jen Perry as well. Uh, who's helped organize this. So thank you all very much and have a good evening.